First item uh, we're going to be talking about today is the dash area. I'm going to be getting in the driver's seat here and our camera operator will be looking over my shoulder uh, going over everything you need to know as far as instruments, instrumentation, a few safety items, warning lights, uh, and so on in the dash area. So let's go ahead and do that next. One. First thing we notice when getting in the driver's seat is the uh, a logo in the middle of the steering wheel and the horn button area here, and it is a Freightliner custom chassis. And while we're on the steering wheel, I might cover a few other things related to it. One is the tilt. And you'll notice where my left foot is there and the tilt pedal for the steering wheel. And it is also a telescopic. When you get your comfort level there, you release your foot. Uh, also on the steering column, we're going to see the four-way flashers. Red lever on the left side there, pulling out to the left is our four-way flasher or hazards. And cancel the hazards by going the turn signal either to the left or the right to cancel. There's also a flash to pass on the turn signal lever for on, on the headlights. The driver's seat itself, uh, a lot of controls on this driver's seat. And if we have the key on there, we'll note that first thing we'll see is pressing the red button, which pulls the solenoid and allows us to move the seat back and forth to a desired position. Behind the uh, red button, we're going to see a three lumbar or different heights of the padding in the back of the seat, which can be increased or decreased by pressing one of the one of the three lumbar support buttons. Next we see a uh, knob that works both on the left and the right side for changing the uh, cushion and backrest angle of the seat. In the forward left, if we get a camera shot of that, we're going to see a push-pull chrome button there. And if we push it and pull it, we'll see that it will lower and raise by pushing. It reduces, it releases the air, actually, I'm sorry, pulling reduces or releases the air pressure and allows the seat to lower. And then by pushing on that same button and pushing and holding will allow the seat to raise. Also in the back with a knob on either side is a, an adjustment for the angle of the backrest. And also uh, if you look underneath the uh, fold-up armrest, there is a knob or adjustment there for changing the height of the armrest. As we continue around the dash, there's some specifications and some labing, labeling, uh, tire pressures, VIN numbers, and so on may be of interest for the driver operator. Next, we're going to see our uh, Allison 5-speed transmission shift quadrant. And I mentioned I was going to pointing out, point out a few of the differences between a large and a small bus. This being a small bus, we're going to notice that, and whether we get any light on over there or not, that yeah, lights up, we can see it a little better. Uh, we'll notice that this particular shift control has a park position. On the large bus, it's a little larger five-speed Allison transmission, a larger model because it's a, a heavier bus, a higher GVWR. It, that particular model does not have the park position. In both vehicles, large and small, I stress that you do use the parking brake, even though there's a park, also stress using the parking brake. Uh, if you look at the wording on the park brake, it's saying, pull to apply, push to release. It is actually a dual purpose park brake. Uh, those of you that are familiar with uh, air brakes, air brake equipped vehicle, uh, as it pertains to the uh, air pressure gauges, we'll talk a little bit more about those later, but if we're losing air pressure and you're ignoring the fact that you uh, have a loss of uh, air pressure, in addition to being a parking brake, when you get down to about 60 pounds pressure, the parking brake will come on, whether you want it to come on or not, uh, and uh, the vehicle is going to be locked up. Hopefully you have had time to pull off safely off to the side of the road before you get down to that 60 pound pressure, or it's going to require to be able to move the vehicle again to have the leak fixed and 
uh, air supply replenished in the air tank. So dual purpose parking brake, normal for parking. If in an emergency situation due to air loss, it will come on as an emergency brake. Continuing across the dash, 12 volt receptacle here. We happen to use this 12 volt receptacle right now for our Garmin GPS. Documentation for the Garmin GPS is available in the, the uh, uh, manuals that come with the vehicle. Uh, above our Garmin is uh, our mirror controls, pretty straightforward there. We've got a left and a right switch in the center and our up, down, left, right arrows for adjusting the corresponding mirror. The power mirrors is going to be for only the large surface of the mirror. The lower magnifier on both sides have to be manually operated. Those of you that are in an area where uh, you have freeze conditions, uh, the vehicle is also equipped with uh, heated mirrors. Wiper controls, pretty straightforward there. Push for wash. Headlight controls, all the way up is off. Parking brake, or I'm sorry, marker lights parking lights, and then all the way down for headlights. Panel dimmer, pretty straightforward there. Uh, next, as we come across to the right, is our exhaust brake. Uh, when the red descriptor is on, the exhaust brake is enabled. What that does is use the engine compression. Uh, if you're in a mountainous area and you're using a lot of braking, the exhaust brake will take off some of the load of your normal service brake, prevent over, help to prevent overheating your brakes, and use the compression from the engine to help slow the vehicle. If you uh, use frequent use of the exhaust brake, you may on occasion say, see high exhaust temperature appear on one of the many warning lights on the dash, and I'll see if I can point that out to you now. If we could. We're going to do our first, as I turn the ignition key on, the first thing the Freightliner chassis does is a, a lamp test on the instrument panel, and we're looking for one that's going to relate to high exhaust temperature. And we're going to see it right there. It looks like an exhaust flow. The symbol there will do that once more. Exhaust flow descriptor with a little thermometer there. You may see that come on briefly if you're... Uh, if you are using a lot of uh, the exhaust brake feature uh, in, a, in a mountainous area. Below that, uh, we have two switches here for our cruise control. <clears throat> That's going to turn the cruise on and pretty self-explanatory for resume set coast. Uh, also the resume, uh, if you press and hold the resume, uh, you can increase the uh, set point or mile per hour and if you press and hold the set or coast you can decrease the miles per hour and it will reset itself at that lower setting. The right of that is our uh, exhaust filter uh, switch and we'll talk a minute about that on the newer diesel engines starting in about mid-year 2007 uh, all the newer diesel engines in an attempt to clean up the uh, exhaust emissions coming out of the uh, exhaust pipe. They have added an exhaust filter and if you get into a situation where the exhaust filter is starting to plug or become accumulated with soot and contaminants, you may see another warning light come on on the dash and we'll see if we can point that one out to you. It's going to look just like the symbol you see on the switch. I believe it's over toward the right side. That one right there, if you get a, an exhaust filter that's plugging, uh, that's going to come on and stay on. And that is going to be an indication to the driver that you need to take the uh, vehicle out onto the freeway, try to get it up to freeway speed, maybe 10, 15, <coughs> 10 or 15 minutes. And that will attempt to uh, clear the uh, 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 exhaust contaminants that have built up in that filter. If that fails, if that does not cause the warning light to go out, you may then have to do what's called a manual regeneration. At that point, you're going to want to reference the Freightliner manual, Freightliner operator manual. And it's going to tell you about using this regen switch related to the exhaust filter to set up a manual regen 
uh, just to make it a, sh a short version of what happens there, you're going to notice when you've uh, done a manual regen, the tachometer is going to go up to about 2,000 RPM. Very high exhaust temperatures are going to come out the exhaust pipe. Be aware of any combustibles that might be near the uh, exit of the exhaust during that time. It's going to take some time for that to attempt to then go ahead and manually uh, clear that exhaust filter. If all else fails, if that fails, that procedure fails, if you followed the instructions in the manual, warning light is still on up here, then you're going to have to contact your local Freightliner dealer to have that, to have that filter uh, repaired or replaced, cleaned or replaced. To the left, left of that is our uh, battery boost switch. Uh, it does what the name applies. It, it gives you a boost of the battery system. This vehicle has a dual battery system. It has what we call auxiliary batteries, and that'll make more, a little more sense when we get up and up above the windshield here a little later in the segment talking about the uh, power panels. But the uh, auxiliary batteries, one part of the dual system is for operating the 12 volt DC items on the 12 volt panel. The other part of the dual battery system is the engine start batteries, also called the chassis batteries. We'll look at those batteries and where they're located as we uh, get further into the uh, training session. But the scenario that we would have is that we get in the driver's seat, we turn the uh, key to start, and our engine is uh, maybe cranking very slowly or just getting a clicking sign sound when we engage the start. At that point, you're going to want to press and hold the battery boost. You'll notice it's a momentary switch. You have to press it to, for it to maintain or to be active, and pressing and holding the battery boost will temporarily couple together the two battery systems, and as the name applies, should give you a boost to get started. <clears throat> Same thing would apply if you're trying to start the generator. We'll get into the starting of the generator later on in the course, but if the generator is not cranking or cranking fast enough to start, you may need a helper here to uh, press and hold the battery boost while the other person is pressing the generator start switch.